Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, we're going to continue looking at Daniel chapter 10. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit as we open your word together. We know, Lord, that there is much that we do not understand and uh, that you are bringing light to us. And we ask that we can clearly discern it. We pray for each person searching for truth, that you can lead them to study these things, to search them out whether or not they are so. And we ask, Lord, that you can strengthen us, that you can unite us through thy spirit, that we can have a revelation of Jesus Christ, and that we can see our need of you. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So, welcome again. Yesterday, we were looking at Daniel 10, verse 7. Um, we looked at other things, uh, Revelation 10, uh, the idea that time is no longer what that means. Um, and we're probably going to be looking that, at that more as we go through this study. <clears throat> now, in chapter 10, verse 7, we had this symbol that we'll want to focus on a little bit more, and that is the 10th day of the seventh month. Now, we take that Daniel, the name Daniel, the Hebrew number 1840, refers us back to um, uh, August 11th, 1840. Right. So this August 11th, 1840, we know that's the 1,533 days from August 11th, 1840, to October 22, 1844. And so Daniel brings us to that time. He brings us to this little book being open, which we saw in Revelation chapter 10. So that's why we, we address that. It's the little book open. It's the empowerment of the symbol of 360. <clears throat> and then we have... Um, other Hebrew words here that we wanted to look at. Now, one was the one that always goes untranslated in English. It's the sign of the definite article of the accusative case in Hebrew. It's the word et, which is aleph tav. So the interesting thing about that, of course, is that's the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And they're the sign of the definite article. Now, the word itself, if you look up uh, in the dictionary, Strong's Dictionary, uh, <clears throat> just take a second here, it's, it's always a slow, this E sword. Um, hopefully it uh, resolves itself here, there. So you can see it's et, just a little bit. It's Aleph and Tav, first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And it's translated sometimes as, as words, as what and even. But usually it goes untranslated. So it, it occurs all the time in Hebrew. And most of the time you'll just see it in brackets in, um, in the King James uh, when you have the, the strongest numbers. So just put it in brackets there. So it's number 853, <clears throat> and um, the it occurs 111 times in the King James when it is translated, right? So, um, let me see. so all these different words it's translated as is 111 times in the King James, but most of the times it's not translated. So it occurs way more times. I'm not sure how many times it actually occurs. Now, we can see the definition of the word, a sign of the definite direct object, not translated in English, but generally preceding and indicating the accusative. Now, it shows up in different forms as well. So um, it doesn't just show up as the two letters. It'll show up um, in, in different ways. It says it's contracted from 226, um, which is uh, ought. Now, ought 
is an interesting word then, right? So this word means a sign. So <clears throat> the idea then of this word, that's the sign of the definite direct object, is it's actually, um, the word itself means a sign or a signal. Now, we can look at this word originally in the Hebrew, the first mention. So if we go to 226, and we find this word here, <clears throat> and we'll look up where it first shows up, and that's going to be in Genesis 1, verse 14. So if we go there, just takes my sort a few seconds to get there. So what you know, you should know what that verse is. So the first time this word shows up in the Bible, it's, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So we're taking this, this word that's not translated in Daniel chapter 10. And we're saying that this word refers us back to Genesis 1 verse 14. So this is the calendar, right? This is chronology. Now, am, in doing this, am I being arbitrary? Or is this something that is clearly being shown to us at the present time about Daniel chapter 10? So this word et, which means a sign of the definite article, comes from this Hebrew word, a sign, right? And it's aleph and tav, the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It brings us back to here. So, and when you look at this word in the only difference of this word, and as they say, it's a contraction. This word is aleph, tav, with a, a vav in the middle. So the vav is a vowel. So usually in Hebrew, there isn't vowels, but uh, the vav and the yod sometimes act as vowels. And in this case, it gives us an o sound. So instead of saying et, you say ot. Right. So so we have this first and the last. Now, the other thing about the Vav, does anybody here know what the Vav usually is used for in Hebrew? So you probably don't. It usually means the word and. Right. So if you see a Vav added at the beginning of a word. It's, it's usually because you have heavens and the earth, right? So the vav means and. So if we have an aleph and a vav and a tet, what do we have? We have the first and the last letter, aleph and tav. Does that make sense to people? Alpha and omega, right? So in this, this word, ot, or et, we have a symbol of Christ, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And it says in Genesis 1 verse 14, that these signs that are put in the heaven, these, these lights that are put in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day and, and the night, that they're to be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. These are symbols given to us. This is the calendar. This is chronology. And it's tied up with Christ, the first and the last. So I hope people can understand what I'm saying, that, that I'm, not, I'm not making a stretch here in, in taking this word et or ot, which means a sign. And the first time it's used in Gen Genesis 1, verse 14, the 
that here in Daniel chapter 10, verse 7, we have, and Daniel, so 1840, August 11th, 1840, alone saw, and then the sign of the definite article, it, the vision that is the looking glass vision. Now, what about the word saw? Again, very common Hebrew word, but the Hebrew number 7200, what does that direct us to? Seven two zero zero. What is that? It's the half of one four four zero zero. Oh, okay, right. So you can see its relationship to fourteen uh, forty, right? Forty four thousand. Right. So, yeah, so fourteen thousand four hundred, right? If you multiplied it by twenty you'd get 144,000, right? Now, in the Mayan calendar, um, I'll just show you here. I'll go here. So in the Mayan calendar, we have these, these numbers here. Remember, 13 here, that's 13 times 144. Thousand, right? Because one back two is one hundred and forty-four thousand. This digit here next to it represents seventy-two hundred. This one represents three hundred and sixty. That is, there is um, twenty. If I go uh, like this, let me see here. I'm just going to do this to zero, so you can see. So this is going to go all back to zero, and if I add 20 here, 20 times 360, it'll just move to one here. So that means that's 7,200, right? So, so the 7,200 is part of the structure of the Mayan calendar. We also recognize it's 20 then, 20 prophetic years, right? So if, for instance, if we go to... Um, September 11th, 2001, and we count 7,200 days, it's going to bring us to May 29th, 2021. And we had already addressed this when we were looking at our lines. I can find them here. There we go. Um, when we were working in uh, in um, <clears throat> this was dealing with uh, the book of Judges, right? We had done this chart and we had marked um, 3,600 months from November 9th, 1989 to November 9th, 2019, right? So those are going to be um, uh, I think they're 360 months. So those must be um, biblical months, if I remember correctly. I'm trying to remember how that worked. 3,600 months. So that would just be, no, those would just be Gregorian months. And then we had uh, marked from September 11th here, to May 29th, 2021, 20 prophetic years. So these are prophetic years. We have in here lunar months and prophetic months marked. So we had, we had dealt with this with the 20 years, uh, a symbol of 20 years and 20 months. So we had noticed, noticed that between May 29th, 2021 to December 25th, 2021 is 209 days, which is a symbol of the 20th day of the ninth month. And then from that date, which is the 16th day of the second month, also in the biblical calendar, to January 1st, 2022 is 216 days. So that's six times six times six days. So we have marked here May 29th, uh, 
2021 as a symbol. So that's going to be 20 prophetic years after November 9th, 1989. So, so that's what we have there. It's just um, this symbol, right? So it's, we don't we don't mark anything that I know of on May 29th, 2021. It is a Sabbath. Um, so I don't know if there is a presentation on that date that was significant or anything, but we have it there marked as 20 prophetic years. So we have these symbols all tied together. The 10th day of the seventh month, uh, 1840. So pointing us to August 11th, 1840. Um, the word saw giving us 20 prophetic years. The sign of the definite article, Aleph, Tav, the first and the last. The first time this is mentioned in the Bible is Genesis 1, verse 14, where it's given as Ot, and the Hebrew number 226. And you can see 226 is 622 backwards, right? The symbol that we have for June 22nd. Well, it's the 22nd day of the sixth month as a symbol. So we can see how that ties to the symbol for FFA. And then we have the vision, uh, the Mara, Mara, whatever it is. It's the looking glass vision. Okay. So is this significant or are we just seeing things that aren't there? Take this line here, Daniel 10, verse 7. How can it not be significant? Okay. So, so if, it's, if we're saying it's significant, it's drawing our attention here in Daniel 10, verse 7, to this message that this movement understands. Right? That is, no one else could see what we're seeing here except this movement. We can see from August 11th, 1840 to the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844 is being marked by this verse. It's bringing us to the arrival of the third angel's message in 1844, October 22. It's giving us these symbols of the 20 years, 20 prophetic years. And we mark 20 prophetic years um, from, you know, from 2001 to 2021. And uh, and then we have this sign, ot or et, of the definite article, but it's it's the first time mentioned. It's translated as a word because usually it's not translated because it's just the sign of the definite article. But when it's a sign or an oath, that is a sign which is based upon the sun and the moon and the stars, given for signs, for seasons, for days and years. So that word signs is ot. And then, of course, we have the looking glass vision, which is what this movement is about. We need a revelation of Jesus Christ. So hopefully that that make that's all clear for people. Um, of what we did with these Hebrew numbers. Now, we know that the men that were with me, Daniel says, saw not the vision. That is, not everyone's going to see the vision. And we, we look at the statement in the spirit of prophecy where she talks about the shaking. It says, but I saw a great quaking. Uh, a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. So we know that there are two classes. There's going to be those that receive the straight testimony, the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Right. And there's going to be those that. Um, cannot bear the testimony and they um, uh, says they rise up against it. So we'll read the statement again. I have what I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen. So we're going to say the shaking and the quaking is the same thing, right? It's just another English word. And I was shown that it was caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver. 
and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. So this council of the true witness to the Laodiceans, we can say, is the looking glass vision. Can we say that? I would agree. Right? Because we know that this is true. And the vision that is true is the 2300, but it's connected to the looking glass vision. So when it's understood, when it's experienced, then it becomes the looking glass vision, right? And so those that receive this, they will exalt the standard, pour forth the straight truth. Now, then there's some that will not bear this straight testimony. They rise up against it. And then she says, this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. Now, so notice the shaking is caused by two things. Some receiving the truth and some rising up against the truth. Right? So it causes a division, a shaking. And then she says, I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. The testimony must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will obey it and be purified. So this is the great need for this church, for this movement. Correct? Agreed. Okay. So this is where we are right now. We're looking at these truths, this chronology that's been given us, this study of God's word in a way that seems on the surface for people who aren't paying attention, and just looking at it. It seems like we're doing a bunch of numerology, a bunch of time setting. They don't have any idea what we're talking about. They're not able to see the vision, right? To them, it's just, you know, nothing's happening. Now, Daniel is seeing this, but Daniel is representing a, an understanding of Millerite history, right? Because he's 1840, right? So he understands August 11th, 1840, and this is in Daniel 10, verse 7. So we're, we're tying all these together, even though Daniel, the word Daniel shows up other places, and these words show up other places. We're focusing, our attention is drawn to them together because of Daniel 10, verse 7. So he's left alone, right, to see this great vision, right? So we're, we're drawn to this, he talks about this great vision. And there remain no strength in me. So we can see that he is experiencing this looking glass vision. We can compare this to Job. We can compare this to Isaiah. Right? We can compare this to Ezekiel. We can compare this to John. All of them had this looking glass vision. Correct? This revelation of Jesus Christ. Agreed where they you know, physically lose strength, but it's showing that we understand that we are nothing and God is everything. So anything we think about ourselves, our comeliness, it's turned into corruption. We just see ourselves as Paul did, the chief of, chief of sinners. We don't see anything in ourselves that recommends us to God that makes us better than other people. That's what the study of this message is meant to do. It's not meant to exalt self. It's meant to abase self. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully that sums up that part of things. Uh, I think, any, any questions about 10 verse seven? I just uh, said. Do you want Stephen? Um, just uh, tying in somewhat with what you said, FFA, 
being connected to 622. Yeah. And you tied Daniel there to 1840 and the beginning of 1533 days. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, 622 minus 1533 is 911. Okay, okay. So, so what Stephen said here is we were going that 1533 days and we're taking the symbol for FFA. So you're going to use it as 622 instead of 226, like the Hebrew word. And you take 1533 minus 622 equals 911. So um, let's just do that so people can see it. Right. It's better. So we take this 1533 days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22, 1844. We subtract June 22nd, that symbol that Jeff had um, understood for FFA, and then you get 911. Okay, so pretty simple. Simple idea. Thanks for that, Stephen. Do I have a comment? Yeah, Dwight, did you have something to say about this? No. Stephen's comment okay. is best. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when we look at verse 8, here's where we talked about um, we just see some different words. Uh, vigor instead of uh, comeliness there was no vigor in me life in me right so that's just another way of translating that word now Ellen White talks about this she says the great truths revealed by the world's redeemer are for those who search for truth as for hid treasures right so that would be what we're doing uh, we're definitely looking for hid treasures Daniel was an aged man his life had been passed amid the fascinations of a heathen court, his mind cumbered with the affairs of a great empire. Yet he turns aside from all these to afflict his soul before God and seek a knowledge of the purposes of the Most High. And in response to his supplications, light from the heavenly courts was communicated for those who should live in the latter days. With what earnestness, then, should we seek God? that he may open our understanding to comprehend the truths brought to us from heaven. So then she quotes verses seven and eight. All who tru are truly sanctified will have a similar experience. The clearer their views of the greatness, glory, and perfection of Christ, the more vividly will they see their own weaknesses or weakness and imperfection. They will have no disposition to claim a sinless character. That which has appeared right and comely in themselves will, in contrast with Christ's purity and glory, appear only as unworthy and corruptible. It is when men are separated from God, when they have very indistinct views of Christ, that they say, I am sinless, I am sanctified. You know, just as soon as the heavenly messenger came from heaven and revealed himself to Daniel, he said, my comeliness was turned into corruption. He had such a view of the glory of God that he fell as one dead. He could not talk. He could not see. But the angel took him and set him upon his knees, and yet he could not look at him. Then what did he do? Did he have to do? Veil his glory and come to him just as Christ came to this world. He took upon him humanity. Then he could talk with Daniel. Brethren, the more we see in Jesus, the less we will see in self. And the more self-esteem we have, the more we are puffed up by the devil. May God help us to put away self and cling to Jesus. Then we will spring up and bear fruit to the glory of God. <clears throat> now, um, yeah, so this is more about what happens when we come in contract contrast with Christ's character. Um, so this is about a person who, when she first kept the Sabbath, she'd been convicted of the truth, had been searching for a long time, but the captain of the whole army were interested in her cause. 
and had put so many obstacles in her way that she did not know what to do. Um, but she said, she says, but oh, how thankful I am, she said, that there, that, that I was here today. Your words were from God. They have cut away my difficulties. I see everything in a clear and solemn light. She related to me how many objections they had brought up before her, declaring the first day of the week was the Sabbath. They no longer admitted it is Sunday. The round of objections, which we all know, was repeated. But, said she, you have enlightened me in regard to my work. I shall search the scriptures until I can give reason for walking in the new light. I believe that many souls will be converted from this army on the Sabbath question. And that prayer of Daniel, how wonderful, how full, how earnest, how complete. Um, I told her the result of Daniel humbling himself and what an experience he had. I referred her to chapter 10 of this same book, where Daniel tells of the impression made upon him by the vision. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. This, my sister, I said, will be the impression made upon those who have the deepest or the greatest manifestation of the Spirit of God. Not one boastful word of self-esteem will be presented by those who have a knowledge of the true God, of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. No one has a clear conception of God, who has a clear conception of God, will be uplifted in himself. This was the impression made upon the man who is thrice called greatly beloved, because he was contrite in spirit and faithful and true. She replied, how hard it is to die to self and lift the cross of Christ. But I thank the Lord with heart and soul and voice for this new victory gain. He who beholds Christ in his self-denial, his lowliness of heart, will be constrained to say, as did Daniel, when he beheld one like the sons of men. My comeliness was turned in me into corruption. The independence and self-sufficiency in which we glory are seen in their true vileness as tokens of servitude to Satan. Human nature is ever struggling for expression, ready for contest. But he who learns of Christ is emptied of self, of pride, of love, of supremacy, and there is silence in the soul. Self is yielded to the disposal of the Holy Spirit. Then we are not anxious to have the highest place. We have no ambition to crowd and elbow ourselves into notice. But we feel that our highest place is at the feet of our Savior. We look to Jesus, waiting for his hand to lead, listening for his voice to guide. The Apostle Paul had this experience, and he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, so um, there's more there, but it's in the same vein. <clears throat> so when we look at these verse, verses, then yet I heard the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. Right. And that we know about the three touches, right? Behold and hand touch me, which I set upon my knees, upon the palms of my hands. Um, now, what was what did we why was Jeff focusing upon these touches? What was the significance of these touches? Let me go back here. So one of the things we had talked about, um, if we look at this verse again, verse nine, yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then I was um, in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground and beheld and hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. So what's what's being addressed here? His feeling of absolute worthlessness. Okay. 
Yes, but I'm I'm focusing not on the previous verse, verse eight. We know that that there's something that happens here, and and we I, I'm I'm looking to some degree at the at the words themselves, okay. so not what the verse is saying. Some of these are symbols, right? That we're familiar with. Some of them not as familiar with as others. So, so we know the words, the words there that the word there that's translated as words is the word debar, right? And we say that this is a reference to, to what? What is the debar referencing? The word of God, commandments, multiple things. Okay, but it's the matter, the things, right? right? And the matter is? This, this is the matter of the 70 weeks. Yes. Okay. So, so we know that this is a reference to the 70 weeks because even though this is, you know, not literally referencing it, it is symbolically referencing it. So he heard the voice of his words. And when I'd heard the voice of his words, right? So that, there we have a type of doubling, right? Um, then I was in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. Okay. Now we have the word ground there. You know, it's at its, it's the word for land and so forth. Um, but we have the Hebrew number 776. Now 776 is the number of cardinal days from November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 1991, right? That is, that count is 777 inclusive days. In our history, when we bring it to November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021, it's 777 cardinal days, right? But we can see that that symbol there in this, in this is referencing this 777 days even though it's 776. Can we see that? So his face is toward the ground, and the ground here is the 777, right? That is particularly the beginning of this message, going back to 1989. Am I making a stretch here in doing that? So we have the the looking glass vision. And when he hears the voice of his words, the words of Christ, which is the matter, this is the 70 weeks. And we have said that the 70th week is this week that points to um, April 5th, 2030, right, as a symbol, right? It's the midst of the week study, which we did at the the prophecy conference. I did a study on the midst of the week. And that this truth, this understanding that's been given to this movement is essential for us to be humbled. That for this movement at this present time, God has given us specific truths which address Millerite history, the 70 weeks the 2300 days, the 2520, all of these come together and need to be understood if we are to be converted. Is that too hard a statement? No, it's a very correct statement. Yeah. This is what God has given us because we're in this movement and we know these things. And if we and we know that this is the straight testimony the Council of the True Witness to the Laodiceans that's being given to this movement at the present time in this fashion. And if we stand up, rise up against it, that we are going to be lost. Right? We'll be shaken out. Right. So this can sound very, very harsh. It can sound very arrogant and self-righteous. 
but it's not. It's just what God has shown us. That we need to pay attention to the voice of his words. Now, this voice, which in Hebrew is call, is, um, or kol, is um, first mentioned in Genesis 3, verse 8. So, you know, I'm just checking here. I'm pretty sure that's the first time. Yeah. So Genesis 3, verse 8. So we have the law first mentioned. And this verse is, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Is this the voice we need to hear? Yes. Yeah. Because we are sinners. And so once man has sinned, we're going to hear the voice of God, the Lord God, and he's going to speak to us. And the question is, are we going to hide from that voice, as did Adam and Eve, or are we going to respond to that voice? Right. So so to me, this is the message of the gospel and the gospel is going to be given there in chapter three to Adam and Eve. But we have that gospel. The reason they couldn't respond, the reason they hid is they hadn't had the gospel given to them yet. But we have the gospel given to us. We have no reason to hide ourselves from that voice. We have We have been enabled by God through his word to be able to respond to that voice that's calling us after we have sinned because we have sinned and we need to see ourselves as sinners. So after his strength is turned to cup and his comeliness is turned to corruption, then he's going to hear the voice of, of Christ. And this is the 70th week, the 70 weeks. It's going to be the message of the gospel. The seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head and the serpent will bruise his heel. This is the everlasting gospel. And this causes him to die, right? That's the deep sleep. But then we have um, Daniel 10.10. Now, 10.10 is a symbol of the siege. We also have the 10th day of the 10th month of the 10th year of 2010, where we have that uh, structure that we saw in, in judges. But 1010 is the symbol here. And it's, he's, and it says, behold, and hand touched me and set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Now, a couple of symbols here. We know the word hand is 3027. That's a symbol of the 27th day of the third month of 273, a symbol of the Levites. But what about knees? It says, which set me upon my knees. So the knees is 1290 in the Hebrew numbers. I know this can be obscure for people, but we know what 1290 is. And what does 1290, where does that bring us to? Seventeen ninety eight. Yeah, so it's going to bring us to the time of the end, right? And we know that Daniel 10, verse 11 to 12 is addressing the time of the end. So when he's touched, that's the first touch. Isn't that 1798? Isn't that the time of the end? The arrival of the first message. Okay. And... And so he's going to be set upon his knees and upon the palms of his hands, right? And so the symbol there is also the message to the Levites. So we can see here in our history, 1290 is going to bring us to 1989, right? Because that's our, our time at the end, which also brings us to 11.9, right? Because... 1989 is 11 9, but it's also 11 9 in 2019. So it brings us to the present time. Those two 777 uh, day periods are, are parallels. So we're brought to the time of the end. 
And, and definitely that's what Daniel is addressing. <clears throat> and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words. So again, he's going to refer him to the matter, the thing, the 70 weeks, that I speak unto thee and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Right. So, so we have the first touch. Is this the second touch? Where he's then going to be stand upright. That would make sense. Okay. Now we know. Um, so, so, well, let's go on here. I don't want to jump ahead too much. Um, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me. So again, you've got that word, word, matter, thing. I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, fear not, Dan, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So he has come 21 days after Daniel began his uh, time of prayer and fasting, right? That is, his words were heard 21 days before. But there is an issue that was going on. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, or the chief prince, uh, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Right? Now I'm come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. And this vision here is chazon, right? So this is not the vision of the evenings and the morning. This is the 2520. So why are we directed to this? Why are we directed to the chazon, the 2520? To help us understand exactly the symbols that, that we are to understand for this day. Okay, right. So we know that the 2520 is essential to understanding this message, right? To understanding Adventism, really. You can't talk about the 2300 days and really comprehend it until you understand the 2520. That is, the 2520 is a message that related to um, the rest of the land. It's the, for the transgressing, the sabbatical rest of the land, that God is going to give this seven times punishment. And then he's going to scatter his people, right? Northern Israel is going to be scattered, never to be gathered. Only spiritual Israel is gathered at the end of the 2520 for Northern Israel. And that's going to be Protestantism in 1798, right? And then we have uh, the 2520 for Judah as well. That's going to end in 1844. So we have these two 2520s, these two periods. And what happens to literal Israel, or more specifically Judah, in their scattering in the four seven times, so Manasseh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, those four kings, they all have uh, a, set, a, a seven times attached to them, right? Correct. Okay. And so those are the four seven times, so they're going to have those attached to them. And uh, those those kings then are are going to end in 
progressively the captivity of, of Judah. And then they're going to be released from that captivity with the three decrees. Right. So this is a basic understanding that we have of the 2520 that no other group has. That we understand the four seven times. There are other groups who talk about the 2520, uh, but they use Miller's 2520. And they don't understand the two 2520s and especially do not accept the four seven times as being fulfilled by literal Israel and then ending with the three decrees, which start the 2300 days. So this truth is really profound. It's, it's something that if Adventists could see it, they would recognize how solid the 2300 days is. But when they just try to have the 2300 days without the 2520, they have a uh, a table set on a single leg, or maybe maybe two legs. But you know, if you have a stool with one leg or two legs, is it very stable? No. You need at least three legs, right? So you got the twenty-five, twenty, the twenty-three hundred days, and the seventy weeks. All of these things go together to provide stability for this message, prophetic foundation. <clears throat> Okay, so then it says, and behold, one like uh, the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision, and that vision is the evening morning vision, right? You can see it's 4758 in Hebrew. So that's the Marath. Uh, by the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. Okay, so so he references the twenty three hundred days, right? Tamara. Then he says, um, "For how can the servant of this my lord talk with this my lord?" For as for me, straightway there remain no strength in me, neither is there any breath left into me. So that's actually going to be, um, so he touches his lips. Oh, so that's the second touch, pardon me. And then in verse 18, then there came again and touched me like the appearance of a man and he strengthened me. So there's three touches. So the first touch he gets up onto his hands and knees and then he stands up. The second touch is his lips are being touched and his mouth is opened. And he refers to the 2300 days. By the 2300 days, my sorrows are turned upon me and I've retained no strength. So he says this period of time is the thing that's making it difficult for me to understand because I know it's a long ways away. So how can the servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me straightway, there remain no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. But then there came and touched me one like the appearance of a son of man and strengthened me. And he strengthened me. Now, notice the appearance here is that same word, like the vision of the son of man. They could have translated it as. And again, it's the 2300 days. And then he's spoken to, and he said, and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, now that word spoken is the bar, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak. Again, this, this word here is the bar, for thou hast strengthened me. And then said he, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. So just kind of as a summary of what we see here, we can see that there's this message. This message is based upon chronology, understanding of the 70 weeks, the 2300 days, and the 2520. 
So we know when we look back here at the beginning, um, we know the thing was true. That's the Dabar was true. And the time appointed, this is the great controversy. And then, um, so the conflict or the great controversy, the controversy was great. And he understood the thing, the Dabar, and had understanding of the vision, the 2300 days, right? So this is where Daniel is in the third year of Cyrus, which is also the first year of Cyrus. And he fasts for 21 days. These 21 days represent the 21 years from Daniel's captivity to the destruction of Jerusalem. And so he, he eats no pleasant bread, bread, neither came flesh or wine into his mouth. He doesn't anoint himself until the three whole weeks were fulfilled. And then on the 24th day of the first month, he's by the Tigris River in Babylon. And he's going to have this vision of Christ. And this vision of Christ is the looking glass vision, right? That's what it is described as. And in chapter 10, verse 7, we see these symbols that point us to the understanding of Millerite history as it relates to our history. And this is described as by Ellen White as the message of the true council, uh, the true the Council of the True Witness to the Laodiceans. It's the, um, can't think of the words that she uses, but it's going to be this message that is going to be causing the shaking, right? And some receive it and some rise up against it. And those that receive it give the straight testimony. Now, in here we have the three touches. So the three touches represent the first, second, and third angel's messages. Is that what they represent? Or do they represent something else? Expand upon your point because I think it's valid. Okay. So we can say they represent the, the first, second, and third angel's messages. I, I think that's clear. But they also represent messages in our time. Now, now, Jeff applied this a long time ago, right? So he used them as the way marks uh, in our history, right? So we could we could place it at um, the first touch would be where the first message arriving, right? Second touch, the second message arriving, third touch, third message. But at different times, we've zoomed in and have different way marks that we mark as the first, second, and third. Can we mark this as November 9th, 2019, Ju July 18, 2020, and December 25th, 2021? For this movement. That, that could be logical. Okay. I think that's where we would place these. And their they're messages... Um, that we need to understand. It's the understanding of these messages that are the touches or the experience of these messages that are the touches, the reception of these messages that are the touches. So we need to understand what those messages are, what they represent, because they're not just dates on a calendar. They're actually messages or experiences that, that we have to accept that have to have an effect upon us that is if we if we don't receive the first message we can't be benefited by the second message and if we're not benefit if we don't receive the second we can't be benefited by the third so we have to be benefited by each message along the way in order to receive the third message now the other thing that should be evident as we start to go through this is that um, he's talking about Persia because he's in the time of Persia, but he's going to be directing them towards Grisha. And, and that seems kind of like an odd thing, right? He's going to, I'm going to turn to fight with the prince of Persia, which is the prince of Persia is not the king of Persia, right? The prince of Persia is Satan, right? We've understood that that this is referring to 
because the controversy is between Christ and Satan in this context. And the Tsar, Prince of Persia, is not the king of Persia. This, he's not fighting against Cyrus. He's fighting against uh, the prince of the powers of the air, right? The gods of this world. And then the prince of Grisha shall come. So obviously it's still Satan. But Satan is first going to work, try to work through Persia. But then he's going to use Greece, right? To persecute God's people. So Greece is going to come on the, on the scene. But he's mentioning this here. For what reason? If we're thinking about our movement and our message. We need to understand what the Prince of Persia or what Persia represents and what the Prince of Grisha represents. Because that's going to be Daniel chapter 11. We're going to deal with primarily Greece in ch chapter 11. Right? A lot of chapter 11 is going to deal with Greece. But we're going to start with Persia. So we need to understand Persia first. We need to understand this history, this chronology. Now, we know that verse 21, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. So when, how do we apply that verse? How are we to understand Daniel chapter 11? How are we to understand that history? It's uh, quite selective. It doesn't mention okay. the other kings of Persia that followed Xerxes. And it just goes from Xerxes to Alexander the Great. Right. So it's going to skip out a lot of the history of the kingdom of Persia. And it's going to, and, it, and even some of the history of Greece, it's just going to go from, uh, basically it brings us to Artaxerxes. That's the last king of Persia that it's going to mention in, in the Bible. It's not going to mention any of the other kings after him. And then Alexander is going to be mentioned. So in understanding this history, um, we, we've recognized that we're not going to go through all of the history of the kings of Persia. We're just going to go up to Artaxerxes, uh, Longimanus, and then, and then we get to Alexander the Great. Now, when we're making applications then of Daniel chapter 11, because that's what we're going to start to go into, um, the main focus of controversy in this movement at the present time has been Collins' interpretation of Daniel chapter 11 verses um, basically uh, 1 to 4, though mostly really to verse 3. And, you know, the suggestion is that, you know, this is some kind of a debate between me and Colin, which it is not. So. First thing is we're trying to understand these verses. We recognize that Colin was given light. And so in understanding these verses, we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 3. We're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 12, 13, and 17, and trying to understand these chapters in this whole context of, of, of this present situation that exists right now. So we need to understand this. So we know that Colin is saying that um, Daniel 11, verse 1 to 3, is the golden image. It's the Sunday law of Daniel chapter 3, and that it's the United States all the way through, right? And um, that this mighty king that shall stand up, because Persia represents the United States, to horn power. Republicanism and Protestantism, right? And it has the law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be changed. And so then he says, when the mighty king shall stand up, that this is referring to Trump. He doesn't deny the historic interpretation of these 
this verse, that it refers to Alexander the Great. But he's saying in this context, it refers to Trump. Now, he has some support in that that's what Jeff originally did. But when Jeff did it, he had it as Trump as the leader of the United Nations. So he had this. And so we're going to look at this, but I'm just kind of giving you a preview of this. That um, we know that the one that we made a prediction regarding Trump. Now, it wasn't a very strong prediction to some degree for some people. But we know the fourth that rose up is going to be Trump. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the chronology of these kings and what they symbolize. And, um, and then we're going to see what Jeff originally said, how he understood this mighty king standing up, because he recognized that this is Greece. And so he applied it to not the United States, but to Trump as the head of the U.N., and, but Colin has taken it that this is still the U.S. and that this is Trump in the United States bringing in the National Sunday Law. And so in his understanding, Trump has to be reelected and he has to be the one that brings in the Sunday Law. And we have a difference of opinion about that. I can be wrong about it, right? So I definitely knew that Trump was not going to be just... Um, get back into power. And part of the thing that we have is we know that Jeff said Trump is the last president, president of the United States. And so the way that we understood that initially is that the United States would fall, but I believe that the United States has fallen. That is, it's been given into the hand of the globalists. So on January 6th, 2021, the siege of Washington, D.C., but the globalists took over the United States, and that is the Battle of Raffia on this line, right? I still believe the Battle of Raffia is something future. So part of the problem that we have is we, we where are we zoomed into when we're looking at these lines? And when Jeff said that Trump is the last president, we have to understand how that is to be understood prophetically. And... Uh, and then we have to figure out which line we're on. So if we know that there's a battle of Raphia, we agree there's a battle of Paneum. And in Paneum, the Republicans would again, would once again regain control of the United States. And, and definitely that would be a Republican president. And that Republican president is going to be bringing in the National Sunday Law. So there isn't a lot of difference between what I'm saying and what Colin's saying except that I believe that we're zoomed into a line that we're not aware of and that he's, he's zoomed out on a bigger line in trying to understand this. So how this is going to unfold, that's partly what we're, we're, we're looking at. So any questions on that so far? Because we're going we're gonna to go back to the chronology of, of this. <clears throat> Is there anything that we need to cover in chapter 10 that we haven't covered? Okay, so there's a comment there. Um, so Stephen made this comment. So the 24th day of the first month is 241 and the 241st prime number is 1523. 321 AD minus 1844 is 1523. So that means there's 1523 years from the first Sunday law to 1844. Correct, Stephen? That's what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. And, and you're just using the symbol of the 241st prime number being 1523. Yes. Okay. So, and so that's rather interesting. I, I mean, there's a few steps in there. But that's one way we could look at the 24th day of the first month is we can just take that symbol. So 241. Okay. <clears throat> um, 
So, so I want to get back to the chronology of this. So we're going to start looking at this chronology in a bit more detail. Um, I have here. Just have to switch these screens here in a second. Okay, I don't know which is the best slide to use here. Okay. All these different diagrams. Okay, so this one will work as good as any. So we know we have Darius the Mede, right? Now underneath we have how we have lined up uh, the presidents of the United States. And we're going to look at that in more detail later. But for now, I just want to look at um, uh, this line. So we have Darius the Mede and Cyrus. There's two times at the end. So just as we have in um, um, in our history, we have Reagan and Bush that both mark the time of the end. We have Darius the Mead and Cyrus that mark the time of the end. In um, in the first three decrees. So this is the line of the first three decrees. And then you're going to have Cambyses. He's going to follow Cyrus, and then you're going to have false Smyrtus. He's going to be the one that stops the construction of the temple. And then Darius the first in 516, he's going to have a decree that's issued uh, that's going to complete the building of the temple about six months later, seven months later after his decree, somewhere around there. And then we have the story of Xerxes in the Bible, referred to as Ahasuerus. And Xerxes represents Trump. And in that history, there is a Sunday law, right? So we're going to, to delve into that in detail. We're going to try to understand this whole line, right? Because this is going to go up to Artaxerxes. So this is what is noted in the scripture of truth. That is, all of these kings are going to be mentioned in the scriptures. But after Artaxerxes, we have no other kings of Persia mentioned. We just have the first seven, right? Now, Darius the Mede is not counted in that list as a king of Persia because he's a Mede, right? So we have the first seven kings of Persia. Now, there is a debate about Artabanus because not, technically he's not a king. He's more a placeholder for, for a time there. And then Artaxerxes is the seventh, right? And he's going to issue the third decree. So we have Cyrus, the first king of Persia, issues a decree. He's going to issue that decree in 536, not 537, but he becomes king in 537 in the fall. And he issues the decree on the 24th day of the first month. And then Darius is going to issue a decree in 516, which is going to complete the building of the temple in 515, still in the Jewish year 516, but the third day of the 12th month of the Jewish year 515, but 516 is, is when he issues the decree. So Jewish year 516. So in our calendar, 515. And then we have um, the third decree, Artaxerxes, which we're familiar with. So in, in Artaxerxes' decree, we have the whole story of the journey from Babylon to Jerusalem with the chiasms. So, so all of these things we're going to look at in detail. We're going to understand this history of Darius the Mede and Cyrus, their relationship, right? So we're going to look at that in detail because these are things we need to know. Um, uh, Cambyses in history, he's mentioned in the Bible. So we're going to need to know his history, uh, when he came to the throne, why he was deposed, and what happened there. And then with false Smyrtus, the story and the controversy about false Smyrtus, and then Darius the first, when he comes to the throne, the issuing of the decree, how that comes about, and what Ellen White says about 
the time span between Cyrus's and Darius's decree, and also the time span from when they returned to the land and Darius's decree. And then we have to look at the story of Esther again. So we have to understand that history, the chronology of it. We're not going to go into depth like we did when we studied Esther, but we're going to look at the decree and, and the history of Xerxes. And then we're going to have to look at Artabanus and try to decide how we understand Artabanus. And then, of course, we're going to look at the story of Ezra. So there's a lot of work cut out. Now, why do we need to do this? Why couldn't we just, you know, skip over this, all of this detail and just go straight to the application at the present time? Do we need to do this? And what I'm suggesting that we're going to do is that is that just excessive or is it needed? Needed. Okay. Now, it's needed. Why? Are we not to understand the time in which we're living? Okay. And we understand the present based upon the past, right? Yes. And, and we spent a lot of time going through the book of Judges, and we learned an awful lot. Now, one of the things that we have to do here, if we're going to study this like we did with the book of Judges, we're going to need lines, right? And we have here a line that has seven way marks, the line of the decrees, right? And we know that we can zoom into each one of these and create a line itself. Now, I don't know if we're going to create a line, you know, with Artabanus or Cambyses or False Myrtus. Maybe we can. But we're going to have the same idea. We're going to take this line of the three decrees and we're going to examine it in detail based upon what's revealed in the scriptures, but also looking at history. Right. So we have history behind this. It doesn't mean when we what's noted in the scripture of truth that we ignore history, right? We don't take that verse and say, well, we ignore history. We just know that what's mentioned in the scriptures are the things that we are to focus upon. Now, this would have been one of the problems with Tess's uh, studies back in 2018. So what would be the problem with what Tess was doing in how she was setting up um, the two the two rivers, the true two channels of truth or or the two you know the false truth and the true truth from her point of view. What was the problem with that those studies for those that know about them? Well uh, she focused more on history rather than scripture or truth. Right. So it was just history. It was it was history that's not directly addressed in the scriptures. There's these battles. Now, we know the Battle of Raphi and Paneum. Those are mentioned in the scriptures. Uh, but the battles that she was talking about aren't directly mentioned in the scriptures. And she also misinterpreted that history, got it incorrect, and then tried to make an application that, that said, basically, uh, we need to listen to MSNBC and CNN and reject anything that comes from Fox because Fox is a false river. It's the bad river and CNN and MSNBC is the true river, right? The two channels of understanding, right? And so, but that was based not upon the scriptures of truth, what was noted in the scriptures of truth. That was just her taking some history and making an application of history. And it doesn't mean that you can't do that. But our focus needs to be upon what's noted in the scripture of truth, right? So God has drawn our attention to specific histories. And it's those histories that we need to understand because those histories are specifically mentioned in the Bible and are typical. Other histories, I mean, we could take lots of different histories that aren't in the scriptures, and we might find the same patterns, 
But we don't say that those are specifically types, that was, we can't make a direct application between just any old history and, and the present. Doesn't mean there isn't, it doesn't mean we can't see things in that, but our primary understanding needs to be what's noted in the scripture of truth. So since these are the kings here that are going to be addressed in this first part of Persia, we need to understand Persia. And then we look at Greece. And we need to understand the role of Greece in the big scheme of things, because there's all these kingdoms of the world. And Greece is one of them, and it has a specific role uh, prophetically. It's a symbol of things like the globalists, like education, the philosophy of Greece. And then Rome also has a place in prophetic history. And so Rome represents something, right? Represents um, authority and military power. And, um, and our country's government, you know, the types of government that it has, uh, Republican government, right? Also a democracy too. So each of, each of these, so there's a lot of things that we have to study because we could skim through this, but I don't think it's going to be beneficial because I think part of the problem that we have in drawing the conclusions that we do is we don't have enough information. So if we're going to make that jump that the mighty king that shall stand up is Trump, in the United States in 2024, in the election that's coming up, then, then we have, do we have enough information to draw that conclusion? Now, maybe if we go through all of this, we, we come to that conclusion. I don't think so, because I think from what I have seen, that there's pieces of information that are missing. That was, we need to understand what happened in the United States on January 6th, 2021, that this was, this is illustrated in Daniel chapter 11 <coughs> in other places. That is, we need to understand the whole history of Daniel chapter 11 of Persia, Greece, Rome pagan, Rome papal, in order to get to where we where we are in Revelation 17 to understand the application that this movement has made regarding Revelation 17. And that is, I think we've skipped a bunch of steps. Now, there's a suggestion that I've, I've said that, that, that Colin is wrong and I haven't given any evidence for it. And, and that somehow that this is a debate. Now, remember, this is not a debate between me and Colin. What, we're, what I'm doing is exactly what they suggest, is that we take our time to study and find out what the truth is, wherever the conclusion leads us. All I know is that when we haven't looked at everything, we can't come to the conclusion that Colin did. But I still think that what Colin saw was necessary for us to understand. So as we start to go through this, we can start to look at the golden image of Daniel chapter 3. We can look at Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Now, I already did studies on the last president of the United States where I looked at 12, 13, and 17. And in looking at the pioneers' view of how they understood uh, uh, the heads, the seven heads of those beasts, um, there was a suggestion that we were rejecting uh, the foundation of this message. And of course, that wasn't the case. We're just saying that what the pioneers understood needs to be considered. It's part of the information that has to be considered if we're going to draw a conclusion. 
So, so what I'm laying out here is a lot of work, right? So we have a lot of work ahead of us as we start to look at Daniel chapter 11 and look at, at verse 1, right? So we start to look at verse 1. We're going to go through this history of these kings. So any questions about, about this study at the present time? Any comments? I think we're just beginning to open this up to where we're going to be able to receive even greater light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's what I believe is that we, there's definitely greater light to have um, than what we have right, right now. So God's given us a way to look at these things. Okay. So thanks everyone. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just ask for your spirit to be with us throughout this day. Bring us together again to study your word. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.